Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to try to get through some announcements today. This will be my first time. Just bear with me. I'll try not to mess it up too bad. Uh, first one is uh, Richard Charlton is uh, going into gallbladder, going in for gallbladder surgery. We wish him the best. Uh, Lois Williams is a little under the weather today, so we want to pray for her. Uh, JD has one more treatment, and then we'll see where his uh, uh, treatment plan goes from there. And let's see, Gary and Linda O'Quinn are awaiting some PET scan results, so we'll hope for the best for them. And then last but not least, Don and Beverly Baskins, friends of Anderson, there has been a diagnosis of cancer in the family. They are getting a PET scan and will await the results there. And we hope and pray for them. It's a good outcome. And that is all I have. If anybody else doesn't have any hope, we'll get a question for the start. Thank you. Good morning. First song today is going to be, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know
Our Father in heaven, we humbly approach your throne through Jesus, our mediator, asking you to hear our prayer. We're thankful, Father, for the measure of health that you've given us that we're able to be here this morning. We're thankful for all the blessings you give us. We're thankful for Jesus who came and lived and died and made salvation available, made forgiveness of sin available, and established the church. We're so thankful for the church, Father, with worldwide. We're thankful for the congregation here at Corinth. We pray that you would be with us, Father, and bless us with growth and spirit and numbers. So we'll be a shining light in this community. <clears throat> we pray for those that we have a small party supporting throughout the world. Missionaries are working hard places. We pray, Father, that you will bless them that their mission will be successful. We're thankful for this congregation, Father. We're thankful for each and every member here. We pray that you will bless us. We just pray, Father, that everything we say and do here today will be in accordance with your will. And your name will be glorified. We're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for your promises that you've made. We just pray, Father, that you will increase our faith in those promises. We pray for our sick. We pray for those that are bereaved. We also thank you, Father, for those who are better, who, who you've answered our prayers and, and they're improving. But for those that ask for a special prayer, Father, we're so thankful that we're able to pray for Gary and Linda Gwynn, we pray that you would bless him and, and Gary and his, his sickness. We pray for Don and Beverly Baskin. We pray, Father, that you would bless them with comfort. We pray for our country, Father. We pray for our leaders. We pray for leaders of all the countries in the world. That we pray, Father, that you would send us leaders that will lead us back to you, that will once again, unite us and let us be known as a God-fearing country that stands up to the world of sin. We just pray, Father, that you will be with us to this service. We pray that everything we do and say will be according to your will. We realize that we're weak and sinful people, Father. We do and say things that we know we shouldn't do and say. We judge Jesus' blood and your grace and mercy, Father. <clears throat> we pray that you will forgive us. Now be with us in this service, Father, and just when you're through with us here, we pray that you will take us to that place you have prepared for us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. That song is going to be Worthy Art Thou. Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of glory, honor, and power, worthy of all our soul's adoration, worthy of thou, worthy of thou, worthy of praise is blessing and honor, worthy of Worthy are thou, worthy are 
Let us give thanks for the cup. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Lord, thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins to wash them away so that we can spend an eternity with you with our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name.
Next one will be, he loves me. Why did the Savior heavenly band come to earth below, where men his grace would not receive, because he loved me so?
Jason song today is going to be Let Him Have His Way With Thee. If you do want to mark that in your book, it will be number 389. Uh, before Alan comes and gives us our lesson today, we will sing Soldiers of Christ Arise. Uh, this one is hard to sing seated, so if you would please stand with me if you're able and willing. We will sing Soldiers of Christ Arise before Alan comes and brings our lesson. Mm -hmm. Soldiers of Christ arise and fight your Israel. 
And so as Joshua, this faithful old soldier, this faithful old general of Israel prepares to break camp, he wants to encourage Israel to stay the course for God. He knows that the old guard, like Moses and Joshua, are swiftly dying off, and he knows that a new generation is being raised who did not witness firsthand the miracles that this older generation had seen. This older generation had seen the plagues. This older generation had seen the manna from heaven. The older generation had seen the parting of the Red Sea. The older generation had seen the walls of Jericho crumble. And before he dies, Joshua wants to remind them of the kind of God that they serve. Our text from Joshua 23, beginning in verse 8, the Word of God tells us, Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all of Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is He who has fought for you. See, I have divided you by the lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes, from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess the land as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you. You shall not make mention of their, the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. And so as we look not only at this text, but as we also look at chapter 24, there are several things that Joshua shares to the nation of Israel that I think is beneficial for the church today as well. And so we're going to start by looking at some of Joshua's concerns. As Joshua's time of departure is near, he sees some changes in the life of Israel that he does not like. And so like any good leader, he's going to address those. He feels duty-bound to address these issues as he departs. And leaders in the church today have that same responsibility. And the first thing that Joshua is concerned about is their complacency. Joshua is afraid that the people of Israel might become complacent. They might begin to take the law of God for granted. He fears that they might become complacent in their walk with the Lord and that they will begin to slide in their lives. Tragically, Joshua was right. That is exactly what they did. And it is my conviction that the sin of complacency and the sin of apathy are among the most common sins that exist in the Lord's church because these two sins inevitably lead to even greater sins. We have allowed ourselves in the church today, I'm afraid, to adopt a Laodicean attitude. You remember the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And unfortunately, one of the things that I'm afraid that we have made a mistake in terms of the church of Christ is we have adopted the idea, uh, Alexander Campbell's idea, of sola scriptura a little bit too uh, passionately. Scripture alone. Now, I absolutely believe in Scripture alone, but I'm afraid that we have sometimes failed to understand the historical context or the cultural context or in the, the example of Laodicea, the geographical context. And as a result, it has hindered our ability to fully appreciate the Word of God for what it is. And the example of Laodicea is a key example. We all know about the lukewarm church, right? We all know about the lukewarm church, Laodicea. And we've all heard preachers talk about how cold milk 
is a good thing. And warm milk, hot milk, is a good thing, especially if it's got some chocolate in it. But lukewarm milk is one of the worst things that you will ever drink. Well, that's a good analogy, uh, but here's what I think is a more important thing for us to understand about Revelation 3 as it relates to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea lays in a valley. And it is surrounded on two sides. On one side by the city of Colossae. And on the other side by a city called the Heriopolis. Now, the waters that flowed from Colossae were cool, refreshing waters. And the waters that flowed from the Heriopolis were warm spring waters. Now, we love nice cold water, right? When it's hot outside, we love something that is cool and refreshing, and so we all love the cold water. We also love hot water, right? Who doesn't love a nice hot shower or a nice hot tub? But the thing was, as the waters flowed from Colossae, and as the waters flowed from the Heropolis and made it to Laodicea, the water was lukewarm. It wasn't refreshing like the waters of Colossae, nor did it have the healing properties that warm water can provide. And, and so Laodicea understood exactly what John was saying, the angel was saying, when he referred to them as lukewarm. And this is also why the angel says, I would rather you be hot or cold. And we have misapplied that for so long, right? When we think of cold, we think of being apathetic. When we think of hot or on fire for the Lord, we think of someone who is passionate. But the angel isn't saying, I'd rather you be apathetic. I'd rather you be a non-issue or, or whatever else. The angel isn't saying that. The angel is saying, I wish you were cool like the waters of Colossae. Refreshing. I wish you were warm like the waters of the Heropolis. With those warm, soothing, healing properties. But you are neither. You are lukewarm. And as a result, you are good for nothing. And just like this water, I am concerned that the modern church is neither refreshing like a drink of cool water, nor is it stimulating like a hot bath. And so, it is not beneficial to those who are seeking. And Joshua's concern, Joshua's concern was one of complacency. The nation of Israel became complacent. And as a result, other gods infiltrated their culture. Have we become complacent? Joshua's second concern <clears throat> is their compromise. And again, the sin of complacency oftentimes leads to other sin. And, and that could also be the sin of compromise. In verse 7, we see that Joshua warns about being complacent and then compromising with the other gods. He was concerned that they would go after the dead gods of Canaan. He fears that they will compromise their standards and bow down to the idols. And again, Joshua, we never refer to him as a prophet, but Joshua's words here, again, are very prophetic because that's exactly what Israel did. That's exactly what happened in Israel. And what about us? Are we just as guilty as Israel when it comes to compromise? Have not the people of God given their affection to other gods? Certainly many worship the God of self, success, materialism, career, entertainment, athletics. The truth is many are guilty of compromise in their lives. We allow ourselves to indulge in activities that we know God disapproves of. All the while we smile and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And it has a hollow, lukewarm feel to it, does it not? Oh, how we need to avoid the trap of compromise. 
In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22, we read this, abstain from the very appearance of evil. And so the thing that Israel needs to understand and the thing that we need to understand is God hasn't changed. If anything has changed, we have. We have compromised our standards and given in to the will of our flesh when we become complacent because complacency leads to compromise. And as a result of this, he fears their commitment. When we become complacent, we begin to compromise. And then our commitment wavers. It is not that Joshua fears that they will be committed to the Lord. Rather, he fears that they will not be completely committed to the Lord. And a little religion is a dangerous thing. He, once again, we see from the history of the nation of Israel that Joshua was right to be concerned. And so, as with these two other areas, there is a word here for the church. It has become painfully obvious in recent decades that the commitment of many is not where it should be. Notice the Lord's idea of commitment. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that, taketh, he that does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I have actually had individuals tell me that the reason that they do not attend services on a regular basis is because they are spending family time together. Well, I am absolutely in favor of families spending time together. But the problem with that statement is it flies in the face of the very statements of Jesus. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He is telling us very clearly that if He is not number one, first and foremost, in our lives, then we are not worthy of Him. And so, in chapter 23 of Joshua, Joshua shares some of his concerns. And based on those concerns, Joshua issues a challenge. This begins in verse 9 of chapter 23 and goes through chapter 24. In this section, Joshua challenges the elders and the people to observe certain truths regarding God. He challenges them to look back and see what the Lord has done and is doing in their lives. And if they would just consider the Lord, Joshua believes that they are likely to live right lives. And so Joshua's first challenge, beginning in verse 9, is a challenge about the wrath of God. While there are many challenges given in these chapters, <clears throat> the primary idea that Joshua is trying to convey is this. If you will serve the Lord, He will bless you. If you disobey Him, He will chastise you. He will punish you. Verse 11 is the crux of the matter. How Israel responded to the Lord was a perfect indicator of their love for God. And that challenge still applies to the people of God today. The admonition is very simple. You play, you pay. As a child of God, you have two possible ways of living your life. You can either live it within the confines of God's will and be blessed, or you can live outside the confines of God's will and be chastised. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. Hebrews 12, verse 6. In Revelation chapter 2, we see a church named Ephesus and how they had many commendable traits. Many commendable traits. But they lacked a deep, abiding love for the Lord. Do we have a deep, abiding love for the Lord? Do we want to be inside of His will? If we are inside of His will, we will be blessed. If we are outside of His will, then we are under the very wrath of God. The second challenge that Joshua issues is a challenge about the works of God. He challenges them as a nation to remember the many things that God has done for them. 
Remember the works of God. If they remember God's goodness, they will be more likely to serve Him faithfully. The mighty works of the Lord on their behalf should motivate us to greater service. When we stop to think about all that He has done, it should be a challenge for us to have a deeper relationship for Him. And the thing is, we'll be that way on lesser things. So why are we not that way on the bigger things? I'll give you an example. I am not inherently brand loyal. It, it, it's not that I'm not loyal, but I am also practical. I'm also practical. Like last week, we're getting three bids on an air conditioning unit, right? And we're going to evaluate that and make a best decision. We're not just going to say, well, we're going to use this company because we've used this company for however many years. Or we're not going to use this company just because I know this person, right? And so it's not that I'm not brand loyal, but I am practical about that. Well, I have become brand loyal to one thing. Um, Bentley's air conditioning service in Lebanon. And here's why I became brand loyal. My air conditioning unit has gone out four times since I have owned the house. Four times. And every single time, no exception, it goes out at four o'clock on a Friday. Every single time. And so when Angie and I bought our house in Lebanon, I move in. And you know what happens at 4 o'clock on Friday? The air conditioning goes out. That's right. And so now I'm in the Yellow Pages looking for an air conditioning company in Lebanon. And Bentley's came out at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon with me not being a customer. They got my air conditioning up and running. They came back out the next day to actually fix it. And didn't even charge me a weekend fee. And yes. And so they have done the spring and summer service and just had a motor go out on another air conditioning unit. They came out. It's not even a question, right? Because they took care of me at 4 o'clock on a Friday when I wasn't even a customer. And so my point is, we'll be loyal, we'll be faithful in lesser things. Why is it, Joshua wants to know, are we not going to be faithful in greater things? Especially when we think about all the things that God has done for us. How, he, uh, how His Son died on the cross for us. How He loved us when we were lost. How He saved us when we obeyed Him and confessed His name. He forgave all of our sins and failures. He adopted us into His family. He has promised us a home in heaven. Bob mentioned answered prayers. Think on His greatness. Think on His goodness. And let the blessings from the Lord be a motivator for us to renew our relationship with Him. Joshua, Joshua challenges the nation to remember the works of God. And third, <laughs> Joshua challenges them to consider the will of God. Joshua's will for Israel, Joshua's will for us is for us to clean up our lives and to serve the Lord faithfully. He makes the statement that he and his family will do just that. It's in Joshua 24, verse 15, where Joshua, after issuing this challenge, tells them, decide for yourself today whom you will serve. And he mentions the gods of the Canaanites. And then he says, but as for me and my family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua challenges us by asking us to remember the works of God and the will of God. It's not just good preaching material. It is the will of God for your life. Notice Joshua's attitude towards the situation in verse 15. He tells them what he expects the nation of Israel to do, but regardless of what they do, Joshua and his family are going to serve the Lord. What a lesson for us as individuals. The sad fact of the matter is that not everyone is going to serve the Lord with total commitment. There will always be those who stand on the fringe of things. But listen, the whole church does not have to get right with God for you to. 
In Philippians 3, verse 7, we read this, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things for loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, that I may gain Christ. There may be those who will laugh at you, mock at you, walk away from you because of your godly commitment. Paul says it is worth it. And so Joshua shares with us a covenant. Shares with the people a covenant and shares with us a covenant. As his last official act, as the leader of Israel, Joshua leads them into a renewal of their covenant with the Lord. And this covenant involved several stones. First of all, it involved a great stone. Before Joshua dies, he erects a great stone as a monument to the fact that the people had sworn an oath to follow the Lord. And so whenever they would pass by this rock, whenever they would pass by this memorial stone, they would be reminded that they had sworn to follow the Lord. Whenever they passed by that place, they would remember their oath and be certain that their lives were pleasing to the Lord. Now, we do not erect stones today to memorialize our oaths to the Lord, but still, we ought to remember them. Do you remember the day that you confessed Jesus as the Christ and were baptized into Him? Did you promise the Lord that you would faithfully serve Him all the days of your life? Have you forgotten that promise? Maybe you've not forgotten the promise, but you've not been living, but you've been living like you've forgotten it. And if you have, rest assured that you may have forgotten about it, but the Lord hasn't. And as the author of Ecclesiastes says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. And so Joshua's covenant involved a great stone, a stone of remembrance. It also involved some gravestones. This book actually closes with three funerals. The first is the gravestone of faithfulness, beginning in verse 29. The first gravestone mentioned is that of Joshua himself. His tombstone spoke about the faithfulness of God to His people. This is the grave of faithfulness that God has used this man Joshua to bring these people into the promised land. Joshua himself is evidence of the faithfulness of God. And those who serve the Lord soon learn that God is faithful. He will keep His Word. He will keep His promises to you. Romans 4 verse 21, Paul says this, being fully convinced that what He has promised, He was able to perform. It also, in this chapter, provides us with the gravestone of fulfillment. The second gravestone that was mentioned belonged to a man who had died many centuries before in the land of Egypt. This is the grave of fulfillment. While Joseph was on his deathbed, he made the following prediction. Joseph said to his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land that He swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joshua died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. But Joseph did not stay in Egypt. Joseph is an example of the fulfillment of God's promises. Several hundred years later, a grave is dug, a coffin is lowered, and a body is placed into the ground, a promise that was made hundreds of years prior. And I can almost imagine that if you listened very carefully to the grave of Joseph 
after it was buried there that you might have heard an old pile of bones not coming to life as in Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, but that of a soft sigh saying, I told you so. The lesson here is that we serve a God who is able to make that which seems impossible a reality for His children. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to His power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church. Ephesians 3 verse 20. And then third and finally, it involved the gravestone of finality. The last gravestone marks the grave of Eliezer. He was the son of Aaron, the first high priest. His grave is the grave of finality. The death of Eleazar marks the changing of the guard in Israel. All the old timers are gone. All those who came out of Egypt and out of the wilderness have now passed from the scene. As exciting and as powerful Joshua's message in chapter 23 and 24 of, of Joshua are, these two chapters are some of the saddest in the entire Bible. We have an entire generation that is gone. And we are faced with that exact same situation in this country today as the number of those who were part of the greatest generation who fought a world war and won, who came home and built our nation's infrastructure, they are rapidly disappearing. As the book of Joshua ends, that great generation who endured slavery in Egypt, who saw the mighty works of God, and who were the foot soldiers in inheriting the promised land, as the book of Joshua ends, they're all gone. Now it's time for a new generation to pick up the mantle of service and commitment and dedication to the Lord. It is sad when the old soldiers of Jesus pass from the scene. We have seen in our own lives those who have and gone home. Their presence, their gifts are still missed by the church. It's an even greater shame when those who are left behind do not pick up the mantle that has been left and carry on for the Lord. Israel turns to idols after the death of these great leaders. Likewise, the modern church oftentimes and even today is walking away from the ancient paths that have been laid down by those who have gone before. God help us all to be like Elisha who lifted the mantle of Elijah. And do you remember what Elisha said as he picked up that mantle from Elijah? He says in 2 Kings 2 verse 12, and I love Elisha. We think Elisha is not as strong uh, and, and uh, as dynamic as Elijah because Elijah, yes, was much more rough around the edges than Elisha was. And so we tend to think of Elisha as being not as strong, uh, maybe a little on the weak side, but as Elijah dies and Elisha picks up the mantle, this is a direct quote from 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. Elisha looks at the Lord and says, You did it for Elijah, now do it for me. Thank God for men like Elisha who are willing to pick up the mantle and continue to be the torch bearer. And the question that comes to us is where are the Joshuas and the Elishas and the uh, Eleazars of today? Where are those who will stand up and be counted for Jesus? Where are those who are tired of business as usual and want to see God moving through prayer in the midst of His people? Where are those willing to pay the price of personal sacrifice to serve the Lord? To pay the price of holiness that they might be bright lights in our community. The God of Elijah is not dead. The God of Moses is not dead. The God of Joshua is not dead. The God of Jacob is not dead. The God of Joseph is not dead. The problem 
with our generation is that there's not an abundance of Elijahs. There are no Moseses. There are no Joshuas. God is still willing to use anyone who will make himself or herself available to him. Is that person you? Be faithful unto death, the angel of the Lord says, and I will give you a crown of life. Joshua challenged the people to be faithful to the Lord. I would challenge you this morning, if you are not a Christian, to first of all, make a commitment to faithfulness to the Lord. Repent of sin, confess Jesus as the Christ, and have your sins washed away through baptism. And if, as a Christian, you, like Israel, have turned away, developed other priorities, Maybe like the church in Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. Maybe like the church in Ephesus, you may have a lot of good works, but your commitment isn't what it ought to be. Then we would be happy to pray with you and pray for you this morning. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, Jesus invites you. And we stand and sing to encourage you. Would you endure Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? You have to bear your burden, carry all your load. Let him have his way with thee. His heart can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. T'was best for him to have his way with thee. Find a place of constant rest. Would you prove him true? Each providential test. Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love. And you will see, t'was best for him to have his way with thee. I want to thank everyone for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Um, if we have no other announcements, our closing song today will be The Battle Belongs to the Lord. I know that we sang this pretty recently, but it's kind of hard to have a lesson on Joshua and not have a, a, a song on the battle belong to the Lord. So one of my favorite Bible characters. Uh, no other announcements after this for our closing prayer. And heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory.
Pray with me, please. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you go with us as we depart from this place to take the word of Jesus out into the world. Watch us through the weather that's upcoming. We pray that you be with those who do not do so well in that weather. In his name, amen. Amen.